With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah. Oh. Sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Yes, Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Psychiatrists have sought the answers to puzzling facets of human behavior for years. Today, we speak freely of phobias, unexplained psychotic experiences. But in the year 1793, a humane, enlightened physician of the infamous mental institution at La Bicetre, a hellhole by any description, was brought to trial for daring to treat mental patients like human beings. He himself was called mad for, as the court put it, freeing the beasts from their chains. But as I said, times have changed. The story we're about to tell you about the horrors that took place in a similar institution is true. But it never really could have happened. Not here. Not yet. Not now. Stop it! Make them stop it, Doctor. That noise, oh, please. It's just the summer night storm, Miss Agatha. You are safe here in the sanatorium. I oh, yes. Nothing here can harm you. That's right. Now, go to sleep. I have to check on the other patients. Yes, Doctor. There are others here who need watching. Dangerous ones. They hate me. They all hate me. You must get some sleep. It's getting late. Hmm. Yes, you're right, Doctor. For the dangerous ones, it's getting later than you think. mystery drama, Free the Beast, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ralph Goodman and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Elderly patients at the formidable isolated Greenbrier Sanitarium have been restless all day. And now that night is closing in and the intensity of the darkening clouds increase, the doctors and nurses double their rounds. The resident psychiatrist, Dr. Paul Thurman, has begun his nightly round of the third floor. Patients on this floor, although completely harmless, do need his personal attention. Most are alone in the world, deserted by friends and family. He pauses a moment outside one of the doors because he hears an unfamiliar voice. Yes, I have watched them. Each night I have watched. Listened. A strange voice, one he cannot identify, seems to be coming from Miss Agatha's room. But that is not possible. Miss Agatha has been at Briarwood for almost a year and has spoken to no one. Be calm, little sister. Nothing will harm you. I've always looked after you and I shall continue 
to look after you. As long as we both shall live. Miss Agatha. Yes, Doctor. Oh, you're alone. I, I thought... Yes, Doctor. I could have sworn I heard... Heard what? Well, I, I thought... <laughs> Uh, strange, there's no one here in the room with you, and yet... Yet what, Doctor? I distinctly heard a voice. Oh, not your voice, Miss Agatha, but uh, an older voice, a woman uh, 70 or 80. You must be mistaken, Doctor. Yeah, she called you little sister. I have no sister. Oh, yes, I know that. But I do have a puzzle for you. A puzzle? Brothers and sisters, I have none. But that woman's mother is my mother's daughter. Who am I? Uh, Miss Agatha. <laughs> no, no, stop. Make, make them stop, Doctor. That, that noise. Oh, it's just a summer night storm, Miss Agatha. You're safe here. Yes, yes. Nothing here can harm me. That's right. Now, lie back. Close your eyes and go to sleep. I must check on the other patients. Yes, Doctor. They need watching. The dangerous ones. They hate me. They all hate me. You must get some sleep. It's very late. Yes. You're right, Doctor. It is very late for the dangerous ones. It's later than you think. But I tell you, I heard it, Margaret. But it's hard to believe, Paul. A strange, disembodied voice coming from Miss Agatha's room. And you went into the room and saw nothing? Uh, nothing but Miss Agatha sitting up in bed. She was terrified of the storm, and the voice was calming her. It's strange. I know there was someone or something in there talking to her. But it sounds so illogical. But there's only one door leading to each of those upstairs rooms. The windows are barred, and... <laughs> Darling, are you sure? Of the voice, yes. But where it vanished to... No. Could she have been talking to herself? Well, she never has. Besides, the voice was so different. The, the entire quality of that voice, it, it was so much older, uh, raspier. I tell you, Margaret, something strange, something unexplainable took place on that third floor last night. If I may say so, Doctor, considering you are an accredited psychiatrist, you're acting weird. <laughs> the word, darling, is weirdly. I'm not acting weirdly, just cautiously. There is one thing you can do, sweetheart. What's that? Let's start by pulling the file on Miss Agatha. See if she has any relatives she hasn't told us about. Relatives? Miss Agatha? Oh, she doesn't have. I mean, I've gone over her file a number of times since she was admitted. She's an only child. Are you sure? I'm positive. Hmm. Uh, that voice, uh, the voice I heard in her room, it called her little sister. Look, Paul, I know I shouldn't attempt any psychiatric explanations, but... You know how lonesome Miss Agatha is, never making friends with the other patients here. What are you getting at? Well, it's a theory that's usually applied to children. But considering how far Miss Agatha has regressed, isn't it possible that she's invented a playmate, a protective playmate, an older sister? <laughs> that's a good try, but just you concentrate on being beautiful. Huh? Let me concentrate on what I heard in that empty room last night. You still insist there was someone in there? Someone or something. I know that's, as you say, weird for an accredited psychiatrist to suggest. But uh, go through Miss Agatha's fire once more. And if she hasn't got an older sister, well, we better start looking for an 80-year-old patient in this institution who can walk through walls. <laughs> This is a progress report dated the 28th. Uh, patient, Miss Agatha Milford, age 37. Patient not adjusting to confinement. Resistance to group therapy aggravated by persecution complex. Oh, yeah, come in. 
A uh, patient is convinced that members of group are hostile to her. Sounds like you're reporting on Miss Agatha, right? Uh, right. I'll be with you in a minute, Margaret. Just let me complete this tape. I bought her file. Everything I could find on her. Oh, well, in that case, I'm with you right now. I dug up everything I could find on her. Good. I'll do my report again later after we check what you have. But it's a waste of time, really. Huh? I don't have a thing. No brothers, no sisters. She has none. Brothers and sisters, I have none. But that woman's mother is my mother's daughter. What? <laughs> That's what Miss Agatha said last night. When I heard that strange voice in her room, I asked her if she had a sister. She said no. And then she added, brothers and sisters, I have none. But that woman's mother is my mother's daughter. Well, I've heard that riddle before. But isn't it son? I mean, that man's father is my father's son? Yeah, but not the way she says it. What does it mean? I don't know. Right now, I don't know anything for sure. I don't even know if I actually heard that voice coming from Miss Agatha's room. But you said... That... Oh, oh, I heard a voice, all right. It wasn't Miss Agatha. It sounded like it came from her room, but... Could it have come from somewhere else? Where? The room is at 30 feet apart. If it came from the next room, if it was Mrs. Haverstrom's oh, room... No, 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 it couldn't have come from Haverstrom's room. My eye passed there. All was quiet. It came from the far end of the hall. I wonder... What? Oh, no, no. Never mind. Let's see that file. Here you are. Mm. Oh, I'm talking about Mrs. Haverstrom. Yeah? Well, she and Miss Agatha got into another one of their brawls this morning. Oh, no. What about... Same thing. Miss Agatha still insists that the gold locket Haverstrom wears around her neck is hers. You know, the one with the picture of Haverstrom's father in it. Yeah, what's, what's, what's this? What's this? Entry here. It's hardly legible. So. Hmm? Look, it's some sort of legal document. It seems to be rain damage. Well, what is it? Adoption papers. Adoption papers? Yeah. 1936 or 39. I can't quite make it up. Hmm. An adoption agency in Greenville Township. That's just across the county line. The well, name on the document is Milford. Yeah. And first name looks like it could be Agatha. Yeah. You know, I bet if we checked this out, we'd find it's Miss Agatha who was adopted. But it's funny she never mentioned well, it. Well, she may not know. Mm -hmm. Most adopted children are never told. Agency records are confidential. But I think we've come up with a lead. A lead? When she doesn't know she's adopted... And agency records are top secret? What kind of a lead is that? That's a tough one, I'll admit. But with a little digging, we may find out more about our strange Miss Agatha. Now, what was that about the locket? The usual. Miss Agatha insists that the locket is hers. And this time she tried to tear it off Mrs. Haverstrom's neck. And, well, Haverstrom swung her cane at her. But fortunately, she missed. That Haverstrom locket? It could be, Agatha, as you know. Well, I don't see how. Agatha Milford came here less than a year ago. I mean, look at her record. Well, here's what she brought with her. Just a few personal belongings, items supplied by Candy Hospital. Oh, no jewelry. Mm, I see. Well, just keep Haverstrom and Miss Agatha separated, will you? Yes, Doctor. Huh. And the voice in the night. That I intend to check out further. How? From now on, I'm not making those spooky nightly rounds alone. I don't blame you. Starting tonight... You're going with me. Well, ten o'clock. Time to make the rounds. Someone covering for you down here? Yes, one of the matrons. All right, let's be off, shall we? Just a few more steps to the top. Oh, careful. Careful. The railing here is not too secure. Railing? This entire third floor is ancient. If you ask me, we ought to close down the whole building. At, at least this crumbling railing should be replaced. Paul, if you'd only talk to the correction board, they might be... What's that? I don't know. It's coming from the far end of the hall. The sack of this room? Let's see, shall we? Yeah, those are the same sounds I heard last night. Little one, there's no need to cry. I'm here with you. Oh, the, the other voice, did you hear it? I don't know. I heard the wind. You are not alone, little sister. You need fear nothing or no one. Do not cry. 
I will never leave you. Is it a voice or is it the wind? I can't quite understand the words, and yet... Listen. Listen. There's nothing to fear, my little sister. No one will harm you. I've always looked after you. I will continue to look after you. Until death do us part. It's a weird voice. It's certainly not Miss Agatha. Tell me, little sister, why do you weep? Is it about the market? Your market? The one that's been taken from you? Is the locket. That Havistrom woman still has it. She tried to kill me. I wish you were dead, dead. She's talking to herself about that fight she had with Mrs. Havistrom this morning. What is she talking to herself? I want it, sister. I want it. That locket is mine. Mother gave it to me. You were there. You remember? Yes. I remember, little sister. The locket is yours. And you shall have it. I promise. I promise. Wait. Don't go. I must, little sister. I must. The voice. Listen, it's fading. Quick, open the door. I can't get locked. The keys, use the keys. Sister, please, come back. Damn it, the keys. I don't have them. Miss Agatha. Miss Agatha, Dr. Thurman, let me in. No, no time to go away. I, I must sleep. I, I must rest. Please, Miss Agatha, Nurse Palmer is with me. I must talk to you. Please, please let us in. <laughs> What have we here? A ghostly, disembodied voice that makes nightly visits to one of the lonely inmates of Greenbrier Sanatorium? Has Miss Agatha invented an older sister to console her in her loneliness? Dr. Thurman seems convinced that the voice he hears is not that of Miss Agatha. But for the moment, he has chosen not to make a hasty decision, convinced that there is more to what is going on and meets the ears. We'll learn more when I return shortly with Act Two. Over 600 years ago, back in the 15th century, two scholarly monks compiled a book of horrors called Malleus Maleficarum, a definitive study of mental illness that proved conclusively that the poor tortured souls chained in the snake pits were not ill, but unwillingly possessed by demons and witches. Two cures were suggested by these enlightened scholars. Cleansing fire to be used against witches and torture on the rack to discourage invading demons. It is recorded that both of these cures worked permanently, but that was yesterday. Morning has come to Briarwood. The strange voice that haunts the third floor still remains a mystery. Dr. Thurman is seated in his office, recording a case history of the frightened, uncommunicative Miss Agatha Milford. The possibility of schizophrenia exists. Further testing is called for. Oh, yes, come in. Hey, good morning, Doc. How's it going? Oh, Connolly, I'm just taping more about that strange experience I've been telling you about. Hang on a minute. I'll shut off this tape record. You know, that's a great way to keep record. Yeah. I've been meaning to buy one of those gadgets for the agency. How's our suspect, Miss Agatha? Oh, please, let's not refer to her as a suspect. She's a patient. One we know very little about. 
That's why I called you in. Uh, did you have any luck tracing those adoption papers? Or is the agency still in existence? You know, you're lucky, Doc. That adoption agency is still in existence. Uh, and I was able to get a look at their file. I got it all right here. Uh, I appreciate the effort you're putting into this. Well, you're an old friend, Doc. For clients, we do the possible. For friends, the impossible. <laughs> Thanks, Connolly. Uh, would you let me see the file? Now, hold it, hold it, hold it. This is a favor, right, Doc? So why don't you let me read it to you? Feed you a clue at a time so as I can get more than just one pat on the back for being so clever. Yeah, sounds like you hit the jackpot. Yeah, I kind of. Now, uh, to understand this complicated dossier, we'll have to start here on page seven and work our way backwards. Finally. Uh, relax, will you, please? Now, let's see. First, we have the patient transfer from Greenfield to Briarwood, the newspaper clippings, and the murders. Murders? I'm coming to them. I'm coming to them. Mm. Ah, here we are. Milford, Agatha, natural parents. Natural? Your aunt was right, Doc. She was adopted. Then the name of the child on the adoption papers, uh, the name we couldn't read? Agatha Ann Milford. Hmm. Adopted daughter of Charles and Henrietta Milford. Her real mother was named Mason. Carrie Lee Mason. She worked as a lab technician at Mercy Hospital. That's where the child was born. A few months before the trial took place. Trial? Yeah. It, uh... It seems Miss Agatha's mother was some sort of nurse's aide at the hospital, took care of terminally ill patients. And she was a very sympathetic woman. Unfortunately, uh, too sympathetic. What does that mean? Well, according to these newspaper clippings I dug up at the library, dated uh, September 1939, the uh, supposedly kindly Mrs. Mason was accused, and later convicted, of the murder of six of her patients. She simply turned off the oxygen supply and let nature take its course, which, of course, was inevitable. Only the jury judged it to be murder in the first degree. Oh, poor woman. Watching those patients suffer day after day. Wasn't the pressure that she was undertaking into consideration by the court? Ah, but that's just the point. Evidence in the trial showed that she was under no pressure at all before, during, or after the murders. According to her testimony, she just, uh... Followed orders. Orders? She said a voice told her to do it. It's all here in this newspaper account. It seems our Mrs. Mason heard voices in the night. Voices that calmed her and comforted her in times of trouble. And voices that told her how to comfort others. Good Lord. Like mother, like daughter. What? Uh, no, nothing. Go on, go on. What else do you have there? Uh, this woman, uh, Mrs. Mason, Miss Agatha's mother, did she have any other children? Other children? Yeah, sons, daughters. Uh, particularly daughters. A girl, perhaps, older than Miss Agatha. Oh, oh, at least not according to the records I've dug up. Mrs. Mason had no other children. Miss Agatha was an only child. Are you sure? I mean, it's important. Could there possibly be uh, a sister, an older sister? Oh, you mean that voice you've been hearing, huh? <laughs> I'm sorry, Doc. There's no answer in that. When the Mason woman was sent up for the murders, her child was put up for adoption. Miss Agatha, that is. Her only child. Now, of course, there are skeletons in every closet if you want me to dig deeper. Yeah, I wish you would. Well, sure, old buddy, I will. The easy way out is to classify Miss Agatha as a schizophrenic. You mean that Miss Agatha and her sister may be the same person? Yeah. Only you don't really believe that. No, not after the studies I've made so far. There are reasons too complicated to go into. Yeah. Well, if I can be of any help... Thanks, you have been... Oh, by the way, uh, is there a picture of Miss Agatha's father in those clippings? Yeah, yeah, I believe there is. Uh, yeah, here we are. Hi. Nice looking guy. Yeah. Mustache, long sideburns, looks like Valentino. Huh? <laughs> Why? Oh, we've had a little dispute over a gold locket. It belongs to Mrs. Havistrom. Inside the locket is a picture of her father. Miss Agatha claims the locket is hers. Well, here, take a picture. Oh. Compare it. That'll take care of one problem. I hope so. I've had to lock Miss Agatha in her room. I had a padlock installed last night. At least I know she'll be safe until this petty bickering is over with. And well, we can try to trace that strange voice we've been hearing. Well, if you hear two voices coming out of there now, you'll know it's just another case of schizophrenia. Yeah, I hated to have to do it. Miss Agatha is not a violent person. 
She must have been terrified when Mrs. Harrister swung that cane at her. Oh? <laughs> Sounds to me like you locked up the wrong patient. M- Mrs. Havistrom is not violent by nature. Look, there's too much to explain. If you'll let me have that photo, she'll prove once and for all who the owner of that locket is. Oh, excuse me. Sure. Uh, Dr. Thurman speaking. What? When did it happen? Miss Agatha, where is she? I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be right there. Uh, we won't need that photo after all, Connolly. Mrs. Haverstrom's dead. What? Dead? The third floor railing. It's needed repairs for months. The poor crippled old woman must have leaned against it. She just fell to her death down three flights of stairs. Hell. Look, could she have been pushed? Look, I mean... I'm sorry. I can't discuss this any further. I got to get to the infirmary. <laughs> I can't keep up with you. I'm sorry, Margaret. I'm anxious to check out Miss Agatha's room. I just don't understand how Mrs. Haverstrom got out of her room and over to that shaky railing alone. Where was the third floor matron? Well, she was called away for a few moments. I've told you never to leave the third floor unattended. She was only gone for a short while. You heard me tell that to the police. Uh, they're taking the body away. When this gets out, Margaret, I... I just can't understand what happened. Oh, oh come on. Let's get to Miss Agatha's room. All right, Doctor. I'm sure you'll find everything in order. Door locked since last night, as per your instructions. Padlock on, also locked. I uh, don't think so, Miss uh, Connolly. What are you doing up here? Just a little checking, Doc. What I found isn't too pleasant. Who is this man? I'm sorry, uh, Margaret. This is Charles Connolly, a detective. Detective? A private detective, a friend of mine. He's been checking into Miss Agatha's background for me. Whatever for? I wanted to find out more about her. I told him about the argument she had with Mrs. Haverstrom over that locket. That uh, Haverstrom woman didn't fall down that flight of stairs by accident. What are you trying to say, Connolly? The woman was dragged from her room and tossed through that rotted railing. She was murdered. (gasps) What? Well, I didn't say anything in front of the police. I mean, they accepted it as an accident, but someone carried her to that railing and pushed her over. My guess would be Miss Agatha. That's impossible. She's been locked in her room since midnight. Well, that remains to be seen. Where's the room? At the end of the corridor. Even if she did get out, <laughs> she couldn't lift a 200-pound arthritic patient like, like Mrs. Haverstrom. The woman wasn't lifted. She was dragged along the floor. I found black heel marks leading to the edge of the stairs and the end of the broken railing. Uh, let's get to her room. Okay, right with you, Doc. How could Miss Agatha get out of her room? It was bolted from the outside, reinforced by a security lock. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. Well, I'm afraid there's just no other answer. There's got to be another answer. Huh? Up ahead. Now, you see that room at the far end of the hall? Huh? Well, that's Miss Agatha's room. And even from here, you can see that the padlock is still on and it's still intact. Well, I'll be... Yeah. Not a mark on it. So it looks okay. It's solid. Sturdy. Who has the key? I do. If you gentlemen will step aside, huh? Well, good morning, Doctor. It's such a beautiful morning, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, it is, Miss Agatha. Uh, you uh, slept well, I trust? Oh, very well, Doctor. I see you've bought some visitors. Nurse Palmer. Good morning, Miss Agatha. And a gentleman I don't believe I've met before. Yeah, oh, uh, this is Mr. Connolly, uh, Charles Connolly, an old yeah. friend. He just stopped by to say hello, meet some of our new patients. How nice. A pleasure to meet you, Mr. Connolly. Well, uh, thank you, Miss uh, Agatha. And may I say you've come to the right place. I beg your pardon? Well, I mean, it doesn't look like much from the outside, but it's so pleasant here. Everyone is is so nice. Oh, yes. Is that, is that right? Mm-hmm. Even Mrs. Haverstrom. She was trouble for a while, but everything is fine now. It's all been taken care of. It has? Yes. Doctor, I have a confession to make. That was my sister you heard me talking to in my room. I didn't want to admit it because of sanitarium rules. No visitors after eight o'clock. But 
Since she won't be coming back anymore, I can confess, uh, admit, that she's been here. Because everything is all right again. What do you mean, uh, everything is all right again? Well, look, Doctor. Look what I have around my neck. Good Lord. Mrs. Haverstrom's locket. <laughs> Despite evidence to the contrary, Dr. Thurman still insists that his initial psychological diagnosis of Miss Agatha was correct. Convinced that this frail, frightened woman could not possibly be involved in anything as horrible as murder, let's hope Paul Thurman is right. Because if he is not, he could be dead wrong. We'll learn more when I return shortly with Act Three. The strange death of Mrs. Haverstrom at the Briarwood Mental Institution could, by those untrained in psychiatric research, be simply diagnosed as madness. Wasn't it Lewis Carroll's observation in Alice in Wonderland that when something like this how do you know I'm mad? Alice remarked. You must be, said the cat, or you would not be here. A simple solution to our mystery, I must admit. But not for those of us who have been expertly trained in madness and murder. We need more time to contemplate, consider, to separate the half-lies from the truths. Listen. And since the death of Mrs. Havistrom, continued attempts made by staff members to remove the golden locket from Miss Agatha's throat have made the patient exceedingly hostile. She has become suspicious of all who enter her room and is now refusing food unless served by the one staff member she trusts, Nurse Palmer. Oh, yes, come in. All attempts to gain access to gold locket have failed. Until this morning, Paul. Look, the locket. Yes. Uh, how did you get it? She held it a little too tightly this morning. The cast broke, and I told her I'd have it repaired and bring it right back. Huh. As simple as that? Where is the picture of the father that Mr. Conley gave you? I want to compare it with the one Mrs. Haverstrom showed me. I've been, I've been trying to open that class, but it seems to be jammed. Oh, here, give it to me. Let me do that. Uh, you'll find the newspaper clipping in that desk drawer, uh, the one on the left. I'll get the picture. Okay. You work on that class. Were these the clippings? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this class seems to be bent. I'll get it in a minute. Uh, do you remember what the, the man in the locket looked like? Uh, was he young, uh, old? Young man, about 30. Well, that sounds about right. The man in the newspaper clipping was about 30. Sort of plain looking, slightly balding. Plain looking? Balding? What's wrong? A mustache? Uh, long sideburns? No. Mrs. Haverstrom's father was clean shaven. Heavy features. It, it was a tin type. I guess it must have been taken in the early 20s. Well, it's not the same man. It's not. Nope. Here, give me the clippings. I'll show you. Uh, see, there. There. That's Miss Agatha's father. There, young, dashing, handsome. Looks a lot like Valentino. Eh? Oh, holy darn. All this trouble for nothing. Yeah. Uh, I finally got this locket open. There, you see. Oh, no. What's the matter? Paul, what is it? The photo in the locket. It's neither the man you described nor the man in the clipping. It's a photo of a woman. An old woman in her 80s who looks exactly like Miss Agatha. And so I rush right over to your office, Mr. Conley. I brought the locket with me. And inside you'll find the picture of that strange woman that we found when we opened it. Could I, uh, could I see that locket, Miss Palmer? All right, but I have to bring it right back. Miss Agatha found out I showed it to Dr. Thurman. She's very upset. 
She says she told her night visitor, you know, the avenging sister, about Dr. Thurman refusing to return her locket. Which means he's next on her list. On somebody's list. Uh, can I look at that locket, please? Oh, yes, of course. Here. Thank you. The clasp is still jammed, so I left it open, you see. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the photo that we found inside the locket. It looks exactly like Miss Agatha. Only 30 years older. Yeah. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? And you have no idea how this photo got in here, hmm? No. I mean, we still have no idea how Miss Agatha got the locket in the first place. The last time I saw it, Mrs. Haverstrom was wearing it. Yeah, yeah, I know. And when Mrs. Haverstrom fell through the railing to her death down that flight of stairs, Miss Agatha was locked in her room. How many keys are there to that padlock? You still insist Miss Agatha had something to do with Mrs. Haverstrom's death. But in order to do that, she'd have had to have help from the outside. An accomplice at the sanitarium. How many keys, Miss Bauer? Two. Mine and Dr. Thurman's. Oh. Since Dr. Thurman is an old friend of yours, I suppose that puts me in the category of being a prime suspect. No, I didn't say that. You did. But you didn't say I'm not. If anyone had the opportunity to assist Miss Agatha in this, what you call, madness, I did. Yeah, Miss Fowler, I saw to that. I mean, you turned the third floor over to a matron that night, right? Then sent her on some sort of errand. What do you mean, some sort of errand? We have a diabetic patient under our care, Mr. Conley. I sent the matron to give that patient an insulin shot. Was the patient on the third floor? No. No, she's in Ward 1 on the main floor. Then that would leave the third floor unsupervised, huh? And it would give you time enough to accomplish whatever you wished. Unobserved. I resent this. Time enough maybe to smother Mrs. Haverstrom with a pillow, drag her to the top of the stairs, and toss her to her death through the rotted railing? Is that an accusation? No, 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 Miss Palmer. It's just a theory. All right. And how do you explain the locket that we found around Miss Agatha's neck? Well, you have a key to her room. You could have slipped in, placed the locket around her neck while she slept. And the photo, Mr. Conley? I assume you have an answer on that, too. Where would I have gotten a photo of an old woman who looks exactly like Miss Agatha? From one of the newspaper clippings I left with Dr. Thurman. The, uh, Carrie Lee Mason file. A duplicate of the one I keep here in my desk drawer. Would you, uh... Would you like to see the clipping this far? A recent clipping? Mr. Conley, I've been patient until Here's now. Here's what but Carrie I... Lee Mason looks like today. The same. The same photo. It's exactly the same as the one in the locker. Oh, not quite, Miss Palmer. You see, the prison guards have been cut away to make the photo fit in a locket frame. Easily enough done with, uh, well, a pair of surgical suits. I've heard enough. I haven't. Now, I've checked out this sister theory Paul Thurman keeps insisting on. So far, I've come up with nothing. My partner Ross is out on it right now. You've had less than 48 hours. I'm He's sure... He's going to come up with nothing, Miss Palmer. The prison is in Greenville. He's there now checking their records, and it's a waste of time. If you don't find any record of an older sister then there has to be some other answer. Because I'm not it. Oh? You forget. The night Dr. Thurman heard that strange voice coming from Miss Agatha's room, that second night, when I went with him to check it out, I was standing right alongside of him, outside the room. Yeah, that's true. All right, if you can explain how it's possible for a person to be in two places at the same time. Oh, that's very simple, Miss Palmer. The voice Dr. Thurman heard could have been on tape. Tape? Yeah. 
You do make it a practice to record patient histories on tape, do you not, Miss Palmer? I heard Dr. Thurman making such a recording when I stopped by his office. Who transcribes those recordings, Miss Palmer? I do. Excuse me. I won't be a minute. Hello? Connolly? Oh, it's you, Ross. What? Well, what new development on the Mason fight? You just found out what? Yeah. Yeah, I'll meet you at the sanitarium and then notify the police. Nurse Palmer will be with me. We're leaving right now. Bye. What was all that about? There's no time to explain now. How fast is that car of yours? It's not mine. It's Dr. Thurman's. It's a sports car. It can do a hundred if you open it up. Well, baby, we're going to open it up. We've got to get back to that sanitarium and let's hope we make it in time. <laughs> Your life. If anything happens to this car, I'll never hear the end of it from Dr. Thurman. I'm not worried about the car, Miss Palmer. I'm worried about Paul Thurman. Dr. Thurman, why? Look, you never told me what... There's a turn up ahead. Hang on. I was saying, you never told me what your partner, Ross, told you. Well, you'll know in a few minutes. I only hope Ross got to the police with the information he gave me over the phone. We're going to need a patrol car to back us up. We've got one. Following us. And at this speed, we'll probably pick up three more. Good. All right, there's the driveway to the sanitarium. Right up ahead. It's blocked by two police cars. Hang on, I'm going to stop. What's going on up there? Look farther up beyond the service road. Fire engine? Look at the throat. Oh, my God. Come on. That building is a death trap. I've got to help the patient. Wait. Your patients are all right. They've all been evacuated. Look, over there in the clearing, the matron's got them out. God. I don't see Paul. Dr. Thurman. He's probably still in there. That's why Ross called. Oh, I'm so confused. I don't know. Ross was calling from the prison. Mrs. Mason wasn't there. She'd been showing signs of violent behavior and was transferred to a hospital for psychiatric testing. Well, that was a few days ago, just before you started hearing that strange voice coming from Miss Agatha's room. You don't think It's that... the only answer to all this. Madness. Security at the hospital is not like security at the prison. Ross checked. They've been looking for her since Friday. I think she's here. Here? But how would she find out? I don't know, I... but somehow she did. Just look at the pattern, Miss Palmer. Patients warned, evacuated in time, everyone out, safe, but Paul Thurman. Now, remember, Mrs. Mason considered herself a humanitarian. I believe she set that blaze to destroy Briarwood and the man who kept her daughter prisoner there. Hey, he's right, right, Margaret. I saw her. I saw the face in the locket. She burst into my office, smashed everything she could get her hands on. Within moments, everything was ablaze. Paul, are you all right? Yeah. I managed to get out somehow after... After I released Miss Agatha from her locked room, that poor crazed woman is still in there. Last time I saw her, she was clawing her way up the blazing staircase, calling out, Where are you, little sister? Don't be afraid. Mother is here. The place is an inferno. We've got to get her out of there. It's too late. The walls are starting to go. She's still in there. She's a goner. Oh, horrible. Nothing could escape such devastation. At least the others are safe. Are you sure they all got out? Yeah. Everyone but Mrs. Mason. Do it. You know about these things, Paul. What brought that woman here? What drove her to such total destruction? She couldn't help herself, Margaret. Intellectually, she may not have known whether Miss Agatha was her daughter or her sister. But emotionally, instinctively, she knew. She was driven by one of the strongest forces in nature. Love, Margaret. 
love. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> 